Serious music, serious music, serious music, serious music. I've been on the hunt for new music, new intro music. Yeah? Something more fun and like upbeat. Okay. Do you, do you have like, do you have any suggestions? Anything in no, mind no, yet? No, 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 no. Listener. Listeners. <laughs> if you're a music person and you have some ideas, hit me up. No, Go to goss we, at gmail.com. Right. What we do need is... The music that is totally royalty free and copyright free so that we can use it for free because that's <laughs> what we want to do. And since we're trying to do that, I have a couple of submissions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was one. <laughs> what? what? I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> oh, okay. I couldn't think of any, any. Gilded goss. Gilded goss. Oh, yeah. Come in for Gail What do you think? That's good. Yeah, the more, like, survivor chance we can get, the better. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Yeah! Is that... Perfect. I think that's good. We're gonna... <clears throat> We're gonna mix that together. It's gonna be great. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Welcome. To Gilded Goss. We interrupt your regularly scheduled programming to let you know we forgot to introduce ourselves... Hi, I'm Justin Palmer. Hey, it's me, Diana Palmer. All right, back to your program. Now, so far on Gilded Goss, we've covered the scandals of Mrs. Astor. Mrs. Astor. <laughs> Warren McAllister. Oh, uh, yes, we did. Mm-hmm. The Party Girls, Mamie Fish and Henry Lair. The, yes. We've covered a murderous love triangle. Mm-hmm. Ghosts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A talking dog. And even a murderous pet parrot. I take issue with that. I think the parrot is a scapegoat. I think something more serious is going on, he was, more devious, more interesting. He was framed. He was framed for certain by another pet in the building. <laughs> and you know what? That, But that's deep. It was the cat. We're not getting, we're not, listen, I know you all really want to hear about that. That's not what this episode is about, but it is something that you'll hear about in the future. But today we're checking that mystery box. That's my favorite box. Mystery box, my favorite. I like. Um, purpose-made boxes. I like boxes from Apple. <laughs> They're good. Because then you like when you unwrap it, when you open it, it's a good experience. They are very smooth. Yeah, and it's like every part of it, you're like, oh, I understand. <laughs> I understand what this is for. And we're crossing the Atlantic for jolly old England. Right, yeah, we're going to go over there to England, right? And everyone speaks like this. This is not <laughs> at all... An incorrect type of accent to have, right? It's not a generalization. It's not also an amalgamation of all the various things I've heard. That's not actually correct. People would listen to this and say, I don't know what region you're from. And then they'd be like, oh, you're an American. <laughs> and that's definitely what's going to happen. So, as every responsible time traveler knows, you have to get the lay of the land. So let's cover some Victorian England basics. Okay. In the Victorian era... It's pretty, it's around the same time as the Gilded Age. Like, it maybe starts a little bit earlier in like the 1830s. Were they wearing corsets? <laughs> yes. Okay. There are many parallels with our pals across the pond in the 1800s. Like America, England is experiencing rapid development thanks to the Industrial Revolution. We have mass production, steam engines, railways, sewing machines, gas and electric light, the telegraph... And a staunch refusal to step away from the imperial system of numbers and measurements. <laughs> Roombas, BBLs. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Not those last two. <laughs> People are, they're leaving rural farms and they're moving to the city to work in factories. There was social reform to protect child and adult laborers. Oh, come on. <laughs> to make... Working in mines and factories safer? That's ridiculous. We know. <laughs> Listen, we had we had it right back then. <laughs> Kids can work. To end slavery in the British Empire, to make education mandatory, and to establish a police force. On the whole, these sound like good things. And the rapid growth of cities and the jobs they provided also resulted in the emergence of the middle class. But like America at this time, there was a huge divide between the haves and the have-nots. Like America at all times, and probably all developed countries. But hey, we're in the Gilded Age, so shut up, I guess. So we're there. 
Victorian England, 1800s. Are you ready for a mystery? Oh my God. Yes. It was 1865 in Paris, France, and Lady Tichborne had just received word from a solicitor in Australia that her missing son, Sir Roger Tichborne, had finally been found. <laughs> that's the sound she, sorry, that's the sound she made. Thrilled, she arranged for him to travel all the way to Paris. And after 11 long years of searching and hoping, she was reunited with her long lost son. Aww. Only he didn't look much like Roger. And he certainly didn't sound like Roger. Oh no. Was this man the missing heir to the Tichborne baronetcy? Or was he an imposter? Oh, my Lord! I don't know. I'm not sure. And that question would lead to two of the longest trials in English history. I love a long trial. You never want a trial to be too short, because then it's not interesting or fun. And there are less snacks. The Tichborns were a Catholic noble family. They had estates in Hampshire, and they held the ninth largest fortune in England. That's not that impressive. <laughs> I've seen bigger. There's probably like, there's like eight more people who have more money than them. Who cares? They were prominent in the area since before the Norman Conquest, which was all the way back in the 11th century. So a guy named Norman went on a con conquest? We're taking it all the way back to the 10s. Sir Roger was the son of Sir James Tichborne, the fourth of seven sons, who ended up inheriting the family estate after a series of unfortunate deaths took out the competition family, took out the family. Yes, and it was all above board. And wouldn't it have been so much cooler if he was the seventh son of a seventh son? That's what I think. Sir James met Roger's mom, Henriette, when he was living in France, and they, the couple wed in 1827, and Roger was born in 1829. And they would go on to have three more children, though both of their daughters died in infancy. Aww. And at some point, Sir James was called back to England, but Henriette refused to join them. She stayed behind in France with Roger and his younger brother, Alfred. And the boys were homeschooled by tutors, and French was their first language, which is important. When Roger was 15, his father enticed him to join him in England, and he was soon enrolled in a strict religious private school. Come on, boy, come back over here. I'll place you in school, and it'll be a, it'll be a real gas. Roger was tall and slim, with dark hair and blue eyes. He was his mother's favorite, and he was a sensitive and delicate boy. And since he was homeschooled while growing up in France, he had a hard time adjusting to private school in England. Come on, guys, you know you like me. <laughs> Although I will say, uh, I've never spent time with as many people as you, and I hope that you can learn to uh, understand my very bad accent. <laughs> but he eventually found his footing, and he was able to learn English, though with a heavy French accent. Isn't it incredible? <laughs> <laughs> and he excelled in Latin. He had the typical aristocratic upbringing, very well educated. So once he was finished with school, Roger joined the illustrious Dragoons when he was 20 years old. Dragoon, I thought you said the dragon. <laughs> Dra Dragoons were a class of mounted infantry, trained for combat with swords and firearms from horseback. I love a horse. I love a gun. <laughs> I will be a dragoon. And um, I want to just say thank you to John Cleese for inspiring my bad French accent. <laughs> thank you, John Cleese. I thought it was like the, the candelabra and like Beauty and the Beast. I think that's probably, there was at least one candelabra that sounded as silly as I do right now. But I'm thinking Monty Python's Quest for the Holy Grail. Yeah. That's, that's where it's coming from. Now, whether it was due to his physique or temperament, he was not suited for military life. And he sold his commission after just three years of service. That's a nifty idea. I didn't, I guess that was the thing back then. You could sell your... Sell your opportunity in the military to your someone contract, else? contract, yeah. That's cool. Then he and his cousin Catherine kind of fell in love. Uh, what? Yeah, he and his cousin Catherine. Uh-huh. She's a, probably a nice person. They were friends? Kind of fell in love. Oh, no. Which no one in his family or her family or their family wanted. Yeah. I think that's a fair rule to have. A reasonable thing, right? Don't marry your cousin. <laughs> so 
heartbroken. Roger got out of there. I cannot believe you will not let me marry my cousin. He traveled to South America and he sent detailed letters and souvenirs back home to his family. I will never talk to you again. I mean, <laughs> here is a letter. I miss all of you. And uh, uh, here is a uh, tortilla. <laughs> <laughs> what? And after traveling around South America for 10 months, he set sail for Jamaica in 1854 aboard the ship the Bella. This guy's like a big traveler. Traveling was very dangerous back then, so I, I applaud his bravery. A prolific writer, his mom looked forward to each correspondence. But one day, the letters stopped. I don't want to talk to you no more. <laughs> and on but April 24th, 1854, a capsized ship bearing the name Bella was discovered off the Brazilian coast. No! And with the wreckage... Sir Roger was presumed dead. This is what I was just saying. Don't be traveling on boats in the 1800s or, you know, close to 1900. The boat's probably made of wood. It's going a long distance. It has sails. And sailing is fine, but it's not safe. It's just, it's just boats and horses at the time. What do you expect them to do? Boats and hoes. No, boats and horses. Boats and horses. That's different. However, Lady Tichborn, mummy, refused to believe that her son had died. She sent investigators to visit docks and taverns to question seamen, and she eventually got the intel that she paid to hear. Interesting. There had been a tale that the Bella had not sunk after all, and the crew commandeered the vessel and took it to Australia. Arr. I wonder. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> Arr, me hearty. We're changing our whole deal, and now we're going to Australia. <laughs> but there was also a rumor that uh, survivors were picked up by a passing ship and taken to Australia. That feels a little bit more likely to me. I like the pirate theory. I mean, pirates are cool. So back at home, Roger's father passed in 1862. And had Roger been alive, he would have become the 11th baronet. A baronet is an instrument. <laughs> and you <laughs> no, play it's it. it's a title in England. It's, it's an instrument. It's kind of like a coronet. No. But it's a baritone. Don't think so, no. Okay. <laughs> so the title was passed down to his brother, Alfred. And Alfred's financial recklessness quickly, it was quickly dwindling the fortune. Before I even knew... Alfred! Yeah, before I even knew that Alfred was about to blow this money, I was about to talk crap about how Alfred got this money because he wasn't even supposed to get it. And look at that, of course. He sabotaged the ship. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. He's like, how do I get, mm, uh, how do I get this money from my brother? Mm, I do not know. I know what I'll do. I'll put a bomb on his ship. <laughs> and this is when the bereaved and desperate Lady Tichborne sought the counsel of Clairvoyant, who told her that her son was alive and well. So in 1863, Henriette placed ads in the London publication The Times, offering a reward for any information regarding her son and the Bella. But this yielded no results. That's surprising. I would have called and said I knew where her son was to get some reward money. A couple of years go by. And in 1865, she sees an Australian ad written by Arthur Cubitt on behalf of his Missing Friends Agency. So she reached out to him and he placed ads in Australian papers on her behalf. My name is Arthur Cubitt and I've got a lot of missing friends out here. And I figured I'd start an organization so he can find them, right? And I'm definitely not the reason why they've disappeared. <laughs> the ads described the Bella's last voyage and described Roger Tichborn as, quote, of a delicate constitution, rather tall with brown hair and blue eyes, and offered a, quote, most liberal reward for any information that may definitely point out his fate. See, she's kind of, uh, right, you're just, you're doing it a little bit wrong, because this is when the swindlers are going to come out because you offered him money, right? And it was in October of 1865 that Lady Tichborn was contacted by a lawyer in Wagga Wagga. Wagga Wagga? A small town in Australia who claimed that his client, Thomas Castro, was indeed her missing son. Now, I believe I've found your son. All right, he's out here in Wagga Wagga. All right, his name's Thomas Castro. I know that's not your son's name, <laughs> but this is definitely him, all right? Can I get that money now, please? <laughs> Thomas was a, quote, fairly competent butcher facing bankruptcy. He was a heavy drinker and smoker. 
large-boned and fleshy, with light brown hair and a pronounced twitch. That's <laughs> such an unflattering description they're of a all, man. They're always unflattering. I wonder, wait, I wonder who the quote is from. Is it from the man who sent her the message? He's like, look, I found your son. <laughs> he's a large man. He barely passes as a butcher and he stinks bad. <laughs> And it was during that bankruptcy examination that he claimed to be entitled to land in England. He also told all his tavern pals that he was from a titled family and lived under an assumed name. Right, of course, I've got, you know, I've land back there in England, and that's how you're going to get your money. Right, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm part of a really, um, you know, well-known titled family and everything. And um, yeah, they'll cover my debts, no problem. So the family had a couple of uh, retired servants in Sydney. So they sent Thomas to Sydney to be questioned by those representatives of the family. And he talked about how he experienced a shipwreck. And he even had in his possession a smoking pipe with the initials RCT on it. Right, I was on the ship, right, you know, and then we hit that rock. And the whole ship got blown open and I was out there and I held on to the, the wooden... This pipe definitely wasn't held by another man named Rich Cool Tim. <laughs> this, is, this is definitely my pipe with my initials. And although quite rotund, he bore a striking resemblance to Sir Roger Tichborne. It's really the eyes, man. It's freaky if you see a picture. They have like the same eyes. I got to look at that picture. Anybody who wants to see the picture, check out our Instagram <laughs> and uh, look at the picture and tell us if you think he looks like Roger Tichborne. So that, and he, along with him having knowledge about the family, that only Roger would know. The family reps were convinced that, you know, this could be Roger. Cool. Nice. They found Roger. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> and pal Arthur Cubitt offered to accompany Thomas Castro to England, and he wrote to Lady Tichborn requesting funds for travel, because catfishing had to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Then Lady Tichborne received another letter, and this one was straight from Thomas. It was crudely written in poor handwriting and used unrefined language. And in it, Thomas called her by the wrong name. He called her Hannah Francis, <laughs> and he made claims to land the family did not possess and had only vague references to his former life. Right, so Hannah Francis, I'm definitely your son, and I know that we have all this land in the in the UK, right, right around where it's, um, Stonehenge is. And Buckingham Palace. And Buckingham uh, Palace, we own that as well, and I'll need to stay there when I come back. That was a wine glass. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was my tea mug. That was a tea mug. All right. <clears throat> With all this going on in Australia, the family was facing a crisis back at home. They were, they, they had butt boils. <laughs> Close. Okay. Close. Lady Tichborn was about to lose another son. That's not close at all. That's <laughs> terrible. Sir Alfred was dying, leaving no heir except an unborn child. And if that child was a girl, the baronetcy would become extinct. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> this predicament may have had a hand in her readily accepting Thomas Castro as her son, Roger. Okay, that makes sense. But that wasn't the case with the rest of the family, who were certain Roger died in the shipwreck. He died. <laughs> no, they're English. Uh, oh, okay, hold on. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, hi. He died. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so a little bit of time goes by, and Sir Alfred has passed. And his wife gave birth to their son. Yay. There was a new heir, little baby Henry. Oh, I love Henry. That's such a cute name. Yeah, especially for a baby. Yeah. And Roger's many relatives acted as guardian to him until he came of age. So they pleaded with Lady Tichborn not to recognize Thomas Castro. But... She instead wrote to him and told him he was to have no communication with his Tichborne relatives and to come directly to her in Paris. Oh, no. Listen, dear, you're not to speak with any of your family apart from me. Yes, so, that's Lady Tichborne. <laughs> so what did the old interloper do? After arriving in London, instead of heading to Paris to see his mother, he curiously went to Wapping, 
a working class suburb of London. And he asked after the Ortons, which they were a local family of butchers. Right. My name is uh, uh, Titchborn, right? And I'll need to know about, <laughs> listen, I'm supposed to go over here to Paris, right, to be with my mother. But the truth is, I want to check out, hey, you know any Ortons around here? Any Ortons at all? Yes, instead of going straight to Mummy, he poked around the neighborhood. He asked a neighbor and learned that the family had left the area. He also told the neighbor that he was a friend of Arthur Orton, who was now a wealthy man in Australia. Yeah, my friend Arthur, yeah, I met him out there. And you know he's making lots of money in Australia. You know, he's cutting up kangaroos left and right, serving the tails. <laughs> That's what they do out there. All this raised the eyebrows and the suspicion of his family even more. And after that, he surely went to Paris. Straight to Paris. He got on a boat. He went straight. Th- nope, he did not. He flew on an albatross. <laughs> he to did not. Paris. He went to the Tichborne House in Hampshire. Or Hampshire. I don't know. I don't know how you would say it. Sorry. <laughs> Which was currently inhabited by tenants. And he successfully persuaded them that he was Sir Roger Tichborne. Right, look at me, look at me. I'm him, aren't I? Right, yeah. That's all he said. And he used this time to gather as much info on the Tichborne family as he could, while also swearing the locals to secrecy. Right, so listen, uh, it is my family, <laughs> but what's my mother's name? Can you tell me that? I'm not sure what it is. I mean, I, I do know what it is, but I want to know if you know what it is. Now listen, don't, <laughs> hey, don't tell anybody I asked you that, right? And I'll make it worth your while. So after several weeks in Europe, he finally went to Paris. Yay! And as soon as Lady Tichborn laid her eyes on that sweet, roundy face, she accepted it. Aw, she's just, she's just a mom who wants her son back. That's all. And, uh, she became further convinced after she verified that Thomas had the rare malformation of his genitals that her son had. Right, you want me to drop trial right now? <laughs> You want me to... It's kind of what it sounds like happened, okay, yeah. Okay, right. I guess so. <laughs> oh, God. I Imagine hope... that. The I same hope genitals... mal- malformation. I sure do hope his genitals were as messed up as mine. <laughs> if not, this is just going to be weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> fully convinced by the genitals, she signed a declaration <laughs> formally <laughs> testifying that this man was her son. Fully convinced by the genitals is a trademark of Gilded Goss podcast. <laughs> she remained unmoved, even when Roger's childhood tutor declared Thomas Crast- Castro an imposter. This man is an imposter. That's what he said. And she gave him an income of £1,000 a year. Woo! And accompanying him to England to declare her support before the more skeptical members of the Tichborn family. Get that money. So how much conversion let's do some math a thousand pounds in the 1800s is how much now okay so i'm gonna convert into american currency because that's what i know i about. only have the answer in pounds <laughs> and okay so then i'm not going to convert to american currency because i do know about pounds despite what i just said and it's <laughs> definitely a thousand pounds that's like thirty thousand dollars a year way off <laughs> It's 141,000 pounds wow. per year in today's money. That's pretty nice. Yes, you know. That is nothing to sniff at. It's tidy. Yeah, yeah, give that. I want it. So why was it a tall order for his relatives to accept good old Thomas Castro? Because he's, like, they're just jealous. <laughs> they're jealous <laughs> of him, and they're jealous of the fortune and the baron at sea, and yeah. they want it for themselves. Well, even though his eyes bore a freakish resemblance to Sir Roger's, the rest of him did not. Thomas was fair and large, while Roger had darker skin and was quite slender. And here's the big one. Sir Roger had a tattoo on his left arm. Thomas Castro did not. Yeah, in Australia, they've got this amazing thing. It's called tattoo removal. (laughs) And it's mostly done with lights and mirrors, but it's very good. You get a, you get a toad to lick your arm. Right. You lick it, the toad lick it, and then they take a mirror and they bring out the sun and they burn it right <laughs> off your arm. And that's how it works. 
But also, Sir Roger's first language was French, and he spoke English with a French accent. And not only could Thomas not speak French, but he spoke English with a Cockney accent. Now, I've I've not really been doing a Cockney accent, right? But this is the best I've got. (laughs) Although Thomas had no memories of his childhood with her, Lady Tichborne remained loyal to him until her death in 1868. First of all, who remembers their childhood? (laughs) And second of all, no, I just feel sad. I feel sorry for her. Well, I mean, she died thinking she had her son back, so can't be that bad. Yeah, I guess it's okay. You've changed my mind. (laughs) (laughs) So easily. Yeah. And now to the court cases. Woo! So growing accustomed to the life of a supposed baronet, Thomas's size and debts ballooned. Hey, is that a reference to his physical body size? It is. He brought a civil case in 1871 to lay claim to the Tichborne lands, now worth 25,000 pounds, and they had passed to Alfred's son, Henry. Little baby Henry. 25,000 pounds? Using the 1,000 pound thing you said earlier. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the conversion. Somewhere around 2.89, 2.89 million do- pounds. That's what that is. Because 141,000 is 1,000 and 25,000, it's at least two and a half million dollars or pounds. I trust your maths on this. Everyone, email us at guildagastagmail.com <laughs> if my maths were correct and tell my wife they were correct. Thank you. <laughs> the civil trial was technically aimed at evicting the current tenant, Colonel Lushington, from, Tich- from Tichborne Park, which, my, it's my new witness protection name. I'm going to become a Lushington. Well, you like, can never, ever evict a Lushington from a house that they're staying in. We are too luscious. Oh. And the, the crux of the trial was determining the validity of the claim that Thomas Castro was indeed Sir Roger Tichborne. And he had supporters. His supporters were the family solicitor, the family doctor, remember those genitals, and <laughs> the family historian. <laughs> I, I think we should all have, we should all have a family historian keeping track of birthdays, food allergies. Yeah. That time they pissed you off. That time it's, they peed their pants. It's all documented. Right. Yeah. But let's bring it back. When funds for his case were running low, his team concocted a pretty brilliant scheme. That turned out to be quite lucrative. They issued Tichborne bonds to the public that could be redeemed as soon as he won his inheritance. Tichborne bonds, Tichborne bonds, get your Tichborne bonds here. As soon as this large man (laughs) gets his inheritance, you will get it too. (laughs) And this scheme raked in tens of thousands of pounds and proved to be an effective PR tactic because now the public had a personal stake in the case. This guy is getting a million dollars selling futures on his own inheritance Mm -hmm. that is totally uncertain. Yeah. The Tichborne v. Lushington case lasted 102 days and cost the Tichborne estate over 90,000 pounds. And since you couldn't just conduct a DNA test, the trial relied on the testimony of 97 witnesses, although some accounts claim it was more than 200 witnesses. I want to take back my previous Lushington voice because it didn't, it doesn't do Lushington good enough. Lushington is such a fantastic name. Yeah, it's going to be my new name. Are you marrying a Lushington? <laughs> is there something we need to I'm talk about? I'm going to need to go into hiding at some point. <laughs> and as many of the witnesses were overseas, the court had to send a panel of commissioners to South America and Australia to collect testimonies as evidence. And Thomas was supposed to go, but he returned after a bout of illness. Oh, sorry, my... My tummy hurts. <laughs> I can't go with you. I'm afraid I've got to stay home on this one. Yeah. <laughs> and his absence forced witnesses to make very dubious identifications from photographs and sketches. <laughs> it's like, do you recognize, tell me, do you recognize this man? And it's just like a stick figure. Yeah. But before the commissioners even arrived, detectives from both sides got to the witnesses first, which tainted their testimonies. Why? And the, the evidence became so contradictory that it, it couldn't even be used. But among the chatter and confusion, one name kept coming up. Michael Jordan. Arthur Orton. I was close. <laughs> so who was Arthur Orton? A very, like, a cool guy that you wanted up, you want him to come over and hang out. You want him to chill with you. 
but you're not sure if he wants to chill with you. He was also the youngest son of a butcher in Wapping, mentioned earlier in our story. He had gone out to sea as a young man. He spent time in South America with a Tomas Castro and his family in a Chilean village. Mm. Hmm. Coincidence? Mm. 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 He then sailed to Australia and led a life of petty crime. And perhaps to evade the law, it is believed that he changed his name to Thomas Castro and set up shop as a butcher in Wagga Wagga. Well, there you go. So what does Thomas Castro have to say about this? Well, he denies it all. He said he just made up the Thomas Castro alias and he had met an Arthur Orton in Australia, but they were just pals who would travel and work together. Right, yeah, my, uh, no, you talking about my friend Arthur? Yeah, no, no, that's not me, <laughs> right? That's my pal that I will hang out with. And also, I made up that other name. And the Orton family even claimed that he was not related to them. But it was later revealed that they had been getting some money on the quiet to keep quiet, you know. Oh, yeah, you got to get that quiet money. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the trial. Thomas testified on the stand for a whopping 29 days. He was asked, point blank, are you Arthur Orton? To which he simply replied, no. <laughs> he said, I am not. No. I'm, <laughs> no. And while on the stand, he made the fatal error of claiming that he and his cousin, Catherine, now Lady Radcliffe, were totally banging. Oh, no. <laughs> which left the entire courtroom aghast. <gasps> That's being aghast. <laughs> and his case further unraveled when testimony of Sir Roger's tattoo was heard. Remember, good old Sir Roger had a tattoo on his arm, and 17 witnesses attested to it. Well, Thomas Castro had no such tattoo. He had a naked arm. Naked arm. Unbelievable. And that was the final piece of evidence the jury needed to dismiss his suit. Oh, man, I don't know if I should cheer or not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> but his legal troubles were just beginning, and he was promptly arrested and charged with perjury. Two counts of perjury. One, for claiming to be Sir Roger Tichborne, and two, for claiming to have seduced Lady Radcliffe, because when the ick is so bad, it's criminal. <laughs> yeah, man, don't, come on. Why you gotta add insult to injury, say you, you seduced your cousin? Nobody's impressed by seducing your cousin. <laughs> the perjury trial was even longer than the civil case, and it lasted 188 days. But much of the same evidence was used. And despite the best efforts of the defense, Thomas Castro was found guilty on both charges. And he was ordered to serve two seven-year sentences consecutively. Dang, that's, that's a lot. The moral of the story is don't lie about who you are and don't say you banged your cousin. <laughs> that's the moral. Thomas Castro was released after serving 10 years. And he claimed prison had, quote, done his spirit good. He was exempt from hard labor due to his obesity, mm -hmm. and he spent much of his time reading. He maintained his innocence the whole time, and he even had a small group of supporters. Thomas Castro and the Tichborns, that was a band that he made after he got out. <laughs> after his release, he was forced to live off his no notoriety to survive. He tried doing shows and music halls, but he just, he was no good at it. He was no showman. Right, it's me, I'm... L look, I'm that guy who said I was a titchborn, right? You guys love this. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was his show, and it was a bad show. Desperate for money, he began writing articles for newspapers. In one article, get this, he confessed to being an imposter. I never was Thomas Titch. I never was a titchborn. I'm sorry. Only to immediately turn around and give an interview with a rival paper recanting his confession. I can't believe I said that I was not a titchborn. <laughs> he tried to open a tobacconist shop with the money he earned writing articles, but that too failed. And he was forced to rely on parish relief. Hey, relief. at least at least parish relief was there for him, you know? And he died in his sleep on April Fool's Day <laughs> on, in 1898. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and oddly, his tombstone bears a plaque naming him as Sir Roger Charles Tichborne. Yeah, so, okay, let's, let's go down the line here. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Okay. We have 
Yes. He didn't speak French or Latin. Okay. Mm -hmm. No memories of childhood. Yes. He could barely read or write. In fact, in the trial, they were all like, but he doesn't even know chemistry. You know, but I, I have something to say about that. I've forgotten most things that I've seen and experienced in my life. I'm sure there are a couple of languages in there. You, you just, you never know. <laughs> you never know. His his traumatic experience of being shipwrecked might have caused him to forget. His Cockney accent. It, I mean, listen, there is an actual condition and it is called foreign accent syndrome. And <laughs> is it maybe he, I'm this is real. And he may he hit his head and he woke up and he had a Cockney accent. And that's just how it is. All right. Let's look at the other side. <laughs> same eyes. They have like the same eyes. It's so freaky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's because it's him. We can't ignore the genitals. <laughs> The genitals in the room. Oh, I, and I feel, I feel bad for these guys. Like, I mean, I they, they wore the same genital malformation. I wonder if they just had like a hernia or something and nobody knew how to diagnose it back then. But wait, there's more. Ha oh. <laughs> <laughs> ha. You were all like, hey, send me the script. And I was all like, yeah, yeah, here's the script. Yeah. Only it wasn't the whole script. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's like that time in Zoolander, you know, with Alexander Skarsgård. Like you didn't know it was a joke. <laughs> yes, that's the one. Was a medieval curse to blame for all the Tichborn family woes? A medieval curse was to blame for their genital problems, <laughs> I bet. So, way back in medieval times, the villagers of Tichborn, Hampshire, in England, would gather on March 25th to collect their Tichborn dole. This was also called the Feast of Annunciation. <laughs> what? Nothing. Just... Any jokes you want to make about that? <laughs> no, it's just a funny name for a thing. <laughs> yeah. Villagers would arrive with shopping bags, pillowcases, baskets, or like whatever they could get their hands on to collect 28 pounds of family, of, <laughs> of, of not a family, of flour per family. And this dole was established in the 12th century. So earlier I said how the Tichborn family could trace their lineage all the way back to the 11th century. And under the reign of Henry II, the baron at the time was also a Sir Roger, and he was described as, quote, gruff and unsentimental. He was basically a big poop. Okay. His gentle and pious wife, Lady Mabella, was ill, and she was on her deathbed. And... As she was succumbing to a wasting disease, she asked her husband to donate a piece Their of land. Their very precious <laughs> genital problem. <laughs> she asked her husband to donate a piece of land to the parish in her name for the purpose of growing grain to be given to the poor during the dole. Aww. Yeah, that man did not deserve her. Yeah, she sounds like a pretty dope lady. Sir Roger was not down, and he refused her request. At first. Okay. Legend has it. That he would fulfill her wish, but only insofar as issuing his dying wife a cruel dare. <laughs> <laughs> Again, he was a big poop. If she could get out of bed and physically encircle a piece of land while carrying a torch, he would donate that land. He was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. She took him up on the challenge, and she had her bed carried downstairs. And with a torch in hand, she slinked out of bed and managed to crawl around a 23-acre field. And that very field is now known as The Crawls. Whoa. So spooky. This guy was an asshole. <laughs> Sir Roger relented, and he agreed to the donation. He was like, okay, I guess. But Lady Mabella, she did not trust this man <laughs> in order to preempt any shenanigans, like, you know, him rescind rescinding after her death. She laid a curse on his descendants. <gasps> you will have weird genitals forever. <laughs> the curse states that if ever the dole was stopped, Tichborn House would crumble, and there would be a generation of seven sons, followed by a generation of seven daughters, after which the Tichborn name would disappear. Wow, did that happen? <laughs> Let's find out. So, 1796 rolls around. And the local magistrate is, uh, the dole attracts too many bangers and ne'er do wells. And he stopped the dole. Oh, no. Yes. Maybe they forgot about the curse. Maybe they simply dismissed it as medieval superstition. But the baron at the time, Sir Henry Tichborn, was the father of seven sons. <gasps> and that was just the first sign of Lady Mabella's curse 
settling on the land like a dark shadow. My Bella got your ass. <laughs> Just a few years after the dole ended, a corner of the Tichborne house collapsed in 1803. Mm-hmm. And after Sir Henry's death, his eldest son, also Sir Henry, succeeded him in 1821. So this new Sir Henry had no sons, but you know what he did have? He had uh, several dogs, <laughs> mm, a nice horse named Jeffrey. He had seven daughters. Ew! I'm oh, just kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. So... After the death of Daddy Henry's second son, the title was passed down to his third son. And this son had an heir. But the curse struck again. (gasps) And his son and only heir died at the age of six. So everyone's like, wait a minute. (laughs) Something fishy's going on. Maybe it's that curse. And they reinstated the dole. Did did the misfortune of the family end after the dole was reinstated? It was too late. Oh, no, Mabella won't let you go. The curse had already set their demise in motion, and it couldn't be stopped. 1853 rolls around, and the title is passed down to Daddy Henry's fourth son, Sir James. And Sir James had two sons, Roger and Alfred. And as we know, Roger was lost at sea before he could inherit. And good old Alfred died in 1866 after squandering most of the family fortune. Luck must have been on his side because he ended up having a son saving the baronetcy from extinction. I mean, there was that. Cue Thomas Castro. He challenged the new heir's right to the title. And what little was left of the family fortune, just 90,000 pounds, that was all spent defending the case. So the baronetcy was finally expired in 1868. When we start our dole, (laughs) I want you to know that if you pass away before me, I'll never end the dole. <laughs> Thank you. Right? That's so sweet. And when we are become landed gentry, <laughs> like we will eventually, I will definitely give whatever land you want away to whoever you want. I won't even have to crawl around it? No, you still have to crawl around <laughs> it. No, okay. But I'll just, I'll keep the promise. <laughs> it's telegram time! Yeah, I hear that. I wonder what it's going to be about. <laughs> East Orange, New Jersey, February 6th. A New York businessman who lives in East Orange is something of a pigeon fancier, recently lost several of his finest birds through the depredations of vagrant cats. A few days ago, the losses became so heavy that he armed himself with a gun and lay in ambush one afternoon when he returned from the city. After a wait, he saw a lean cat emerge from the coat with one of his finest pigeons in its mouth. He fired! and the cat fell dead. In the early transports of his joy at having destroyed the thief, he forgot that there was yet a task for him to perform, but soon recollected that the body must be disposed of. First, he thought of digging a hole in the backyard and interring the cat therein, but then he trembled when he thought what the neighbors might think he was burying. At last, a bright idea struck him. I'll wrap the cat in papers and throw it off the ferry boat when I cross in the morning, he promised himself. So with the bundle neatly tied, he took the train on the following morning. He got off the train and boarded the boat, and there he was greeted by a group of friends, from whom he could not escape. He reflected that he might have to make embarrassing explanations if he threw the bundle overboard while he was with them, and he deferred the act until the boat landed, thinking that he could easily cast it away in an ash barrel on the way to the office. He passed several ash barrels on his way, but somehow or other someone always seemed to be gazing in his direction when he approached one, and once or twice he saw a watchful policeman. He recollected how unpleasant discoveries had been made in ash barrels, and he didn't want to be arrested on suspicion. So he went all the way to the office and carefully locked the body in a closet, reflecting that he could throw it overboard on his way home. Going across the river that night, he met some more sociable acquaintances, and the cat boarded the train with him as a result. He laid the package down beside him and tried to become absorbed in his paper, but that everlasting cat haunted him. When he reached his station, he picked up a package and went home. Reaching there, he handed the bundle to the cook and, as indifferently as he could, told her to bury the cat in the backyard. Yes, sir, said the woman. There were a few minutes of relief for the East Orangeite, but soon the cook reappeared. I guess there's some mistake, sir. This isn't a cat in the paper. It's a nice leg of mutton. The man had evidently picked up the wrong bundle on leaving the train. 
and he only hopes the other fellow who reached home with a dead cat doesn't learn his identity. I mean, with the right seasoning, <laughs> I don't see the problem. I mean, you could probably slam down that cat, and it wouldn't be that bad. El Gato Tacos. <laughs> No. margaritas. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I bet you got yourself a night. Overall, the mutton's probably better. Probably just easier. I mean, lemons in the lemonade, though. The poor person who took home that cat. They must have thought their butcher played a very nasty trick on them. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. <laughs> the, dear the butcher, the butcher gave me a dead cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, guys. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my God. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Oh As always, gosh. it has been a blast. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> we love hanging out with you guys. Yes. Please share the word. Tell your friends. If you have any questions, comments, ideas for episodes, hit us up at guildedgoss at gmail.com. If you have criticisms for my very, <laughs> very bad accents at times, I will appreciate it. Please do tell me. <laughs> and if you want to see pictures of today's episode then please follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Gilded Goss Podcast. Follow us. Join the egg cult. <laughs> <laughs> and until next time, farewell, cabbages. It's time to face the corn! <laughs>